And welcome to another episode of Tennis Channel Inside In on the Tennis Podcast Network. Mitch Michaels here in the Santa Monica Studios. Another edition where we get to talk to the players on tour of this game that we know and love. And our guest this week, uh, it's a big one. Trust me at that. Uh, this is the uh, first Canadian player I've had a chance to talk to. In 2014, she actually was the Canadian Athlete of the Year. So sorry, Sidney Crosby, you didn't quite make it that year. But uh been on the WTA tour since 2013 and uh, has had her first real taste of TV work, major tennis exposure here at Tennis Channel while she recovers from an injury. It's the one and only Jeannie Bouchard. Jeannie, thank you for joining the show. Thank you for having me. I wanted to get into a lot of different things with you, but I think the first thing is the basis of you know, why your name, why you were named what you are, Eugenie, the obsession with the royal family that your mother has and uh, Princess Eugenie of York, if I have that right. You do have that right. Yes, I have a twin sister and her name is Beatrice. So we were named after the princesses Beatrice and Eugenie. In Wimbl at Wimbledon in London, they love it because they are yeah. obsessed with royals. And so they love when other people are obsessed with royals as well. And so the story is just my mom loved classic traditional names. And since we were twins and they were two sisters, just named us after them. And so, yeah, I mean, she is kind of a royal junkie. So, yeah, 11th in line in succession I saw, which, I mean, it's good. I mean, not top five in the world, but it's close, I guess. Uh, I, think, I think the bigger question is, though, can you paint like she can? No. Oh, my no. gosh, no. <laughs> no. I, I don't look. There's a limit to my talents, okay? <laughs> well, you know, I don't want to. Uh, we got a lot to discuss here in, in the time that we have. But uh, the first question foremost is, how's the injury recovery going? I think a lot of us were excited to see you back and have success on the court in Guadalajara making that final. But, you know, unfortunately, the injury bug hits you again. How's that recovery process going? Yes, thank you for asking. It's going well. So it's been two and a half months now since I had the surgery. And so I'm still in the process of really just doing rehab every single day. I have to get my shoulder worked on. I have to do exercises with bands, exercises that are just like kind of range of motion type and so I'm not on the court yet. I think I need about another month or so before I can get on the court and start that progression of training. How fun did it feel for you to be back out there in some big matchups, another final? I know it didn't go your way, but getting back out there and then losing to a player that's actually had a pretty good year too, so not a bad loss at that. Yes, and I felt like my, my game was, you know, playing better and better after the pandemic. I took a lot of time to train during those months off we had from tournaments and I was at my lowest ranking I had been since I was 16 years old. So I was really kind of dying to play a tournament and get back to where I know I belong. And when you're forced not to play, sometimes it's like you want, you get more motivated than if you just choose to like take a week off or whatever. So after the pandemic, I was super uh, focused. I tried to play a lot of tournaments and I feel like I, I was playing well even last year. I made a final in Istanbul as well. So two finals, two losses, but it's better than not even reaching the <laughs> that's, final. Isn't that's it? That's a good way to look at it. And I think Istanbul was the first match where first run where people were saying she's in better shape. Do you think that's a fair assessment that you got yourself in better shape coming back from the COVID break and getting back out there? That was the main goal during that pandemic. I train out in Vegas with Gil Reyes, Andres oh, yeah. Agassiz, former strength coach. And we were like, okay, we have a block of time to train now. And as tennis players, we don't normally have a period of time like that to train. It's always rushed in the off season. Okay, a couple weeks off, a couple weeks of training, and then boom, you already have to fly to Australia. Yeah. So we were like we are going to make an actual difference and take the time. So I really worked on fitness. I was doing it every single day besides a day off a week, approximately during the pandemic break. And I felt great coming out of it. There's very few people that I think you could have seen better off than Gil Reyes. Like his, his, his resume speaks for itself. Of in tennis. course. Yeah. That's why I went, I went out there to kind of, I mean, I've known him since I'm, si I'm 16 years old, so it's been over 10 years, but a year and a half ago, I decided to spend more time really making that my training base because I just wanted to feel strong on the court and not feel like I'm fading in third sets. So I, I want to get to your backstory a little bit. It's a, it's a fascinating and unique one like most in the tennis world. Um, growing up in Canada, Montreal, what do you think made you different as a kid? Aside from just being taller than all of your siblings, what do you think made you different? And how does, how does a girl in, in Montreal pick up a sport where they haven't really had a lot of national success? That's a very good question, but it just shows you that someone can come from somewhere unexpected and to not put limitations on people just by stereotype and things like that. But 
You know, the first earliest story of where I knew I was a bit different would be when my parents put my sister and I, so we're the same age, at age five, in these tennis groups, like one hour class once a week, every like Friday afternoon after kindergarten. And the group consisted mostly of like games and hand-eye coordination things like jumping in hoops and bouncing balloons on your racket and things like that. And all of the kids loved it because it was fun. It was games, but we only actually, they only fed us tennis balls 10 minutes at the end of the hour. And so I would leave those classes like in tears and say to my parents, we only play for 10 minutes out of the hour. Like I hate this. More, yeah. And every other normal kid <laughs> loved it because it was fun. So I was the anomaly. I was the weird one. And my parents were like, wow, okay. She really likes the sport. And so they started putting me in like groups, group lessons three times a week. I started doing private lessons as well. And I played my first tournament when I was eight. And my twin sister, meanwhile, retired at the age of six. So oh. so that love, I mean, I'm starting to see the, the trend talking to enough tennis players that there's like a weirdness to just how obsessed they are with the game. You always had that same level of love. You never felt burned out. You, I mean, you moved to Florida. That's a, a pretty big commitment for a kid to make, but you were always in love with the sport. I was, yes. My parents decided, look, if we're going to have a real shot uh, in the in the North America, the best places for tennis are kind of California and Florida. You can play outside all year round. The level of coaching is higher. The amount and variety of players was higher than Canada at the time, which really didn't have good infrastructure for tennis. So we moved there when I was 12 and I trained full time in an academy and did school online and really like changed my whole life. So what was, if you don't mind me asking, what was the best piece of advice that you received, whether it was your parents or coaches on the way up, like when you're starting to make a name for yourself, mm -hmm. is there a piece of advice that stands out that really stuck and kind of got you going along in the right way? I mean, one piece of advice from my coach, Nick Saviano from back in the day, he, he just always, he never like limited me. He always, right. we always had the plan of it's not really, if it's going to happen, it's more like when, and I think you have to have that mindset to really strive for the top or else you won't even have a chance to get there. And you might not achieve it, but you'll still achieve good things along the way. But I never like questioned what I was doing. I mean, the rise that you had was pretty phenomenal even before we get to the pro success because Wimbledon Junior Championships 2012, Svitolina, who's gone on to have a tremendous pro career, beat her pretty handily. And one of the things that stood out to me in looking at that match is you played kind of a pretty different style than your pro game was. Like it was more defensive. You were in tremendous shape. But when you started to turn pro 2013 and then obviously the 2014 season, did you make a conscious effort to say, I have to be more aggressive out here and how I play? I think over the years, I was in the process of developing shots and weapons. And that's always what I did with my coach. It was really about the long term. It was always about the future. And so we kind of tried to not focus on short term results, junior results, even though it's important to play those events and, and play the best competition in the world in your age bracket. But it's not like a guarantee to success in the pros. So it was really like, let's build a game for the future for when I am in the pros. And so I think I started, you know, feeling better on my serve, uh, being able to control the point more with my forehand and things like that in the, as I transitioned. So what was more surreal then in 2012 at that Wimbledon? Was it winning the actual tournament or meeting Roger Federer at the ball? Look, you can't forget, I also won the doubles. Yeah. And the week before was Roehampton, which is a warm-up event, and I won the singles and doubles there. So I won, like, something like 22 <laughs> matches in a row oh. on grass, and so I was full of confidence. But it was in, it's funny you say that because as soon as we got to the, s the finals of the doubles, I was like, okay, we can relax now <laughs> because we're going to for sure go to the ball if yeah. you make the finals. Yeah. And uh, obviously... The, the goal was to at least make it to the Wimbledon ball because that's such a big deal, especially yeah. when you're a junior. Like, it's like one of those moments that you'll never forget. Jeannie Bouchard here on Tennis Channel Inside In. Yeah, I'd have to imagine with how your career was blossoming, there was definitely a lot of buzz going into it. And you had that good 2013 year where you were ranked just outside the top 30. 2014, we're looking back at it. It's one of the better years any woman had that whole decade making three slam semifinals, one of those was a final. I mean, that's a short list. You're looking at the Williams sisters and Kerber, and I think that's pretty much it for that decade. But my question being, how did it all come together so fast for you, where you went from a solid player on the pro tour making a living to consistently making the semis and finals of big events? You know, I think the answer to that is just 
for us, and I, I saw Jensen Brooksby talking about this in DC where he said, hey, this is not a surprise. Like, I've been working my whole life for this. My answer, I've always said that since I've been on the pro tour. It's like, oh my gosh, this is an overnight success. Like, no, it's not. Yeah. I've been doing this since I'm five years old. So I've wanted to achieve these things. I've been planning to achieve these things. And you just keep working, working, working until it clicks. And so it's a long time coming. There were a lot of big names, champions, past and then future that you beat along the way. I guess this is more of the tennis nerd out question. How often were you studying like your opponents going into these matches, trying to really pick up on what they do and really look at the tape, so to speak? Well, I think watching tape is something we should all do much more in tennis. And now that I've been in TV, I've yeah. watched more tennis than I ever have in my entire life, like combined oh, yeah. <laughs> as I did in the past 10 days. And I think that's something I want to add more going forward. As for what I've done in the past, I've really left that up to my coach. So my coach will watch and study and then come back to me with his kind of summary of my opponent. And then, of course, the game plan and, and what to do. I would argue that as far as tennis people go, maybe you can talk about the big three back in the day, but it's hard to find. Like we all talk about that life changing moment of you have success, you're famous now. I was trying to think about this. I don't really know anyone that's life's probably changed more than yours did when you when you rose up to the top. I mean, you're still the most you know followed social media athlete in Canada now that George St. Pierre is retired. <laughs> but I have to imagine it's hard for anybody to stay grounded and stay you know normal, so to speak. I mean, you by all accounts, and we we know each other for the 15 minutes of this conference. <laughs> seem pretty normal, which oh, I think well, <laughs> I'm hiding it all from you. Don't <laughs> worry, hiding it all. But no, I mean it. It had to have been a challenge to get used to this newfound fame because while you did work really hard to get what you accomplished, the fame thing did kind of happen overnight. Yes, I agree with that. The fame comes quickly with it, and that's the part that I think most athletes or anybody really is the least prepared for because you're training and you're planning for results and expecting these results and preparing for good results. But I, I wasn't prepared for the fame that would come with it. I wasn't prepared of like, okay, your life is going to be like this now. Like no one knows ahead of time yeah. and you don't really want to prematurely do that either. Cause if it never comes, you know, you don't want to start thinking you're bigger than you are. Right. So I always just kept my head down and stayed in my bubble. And the biggest thing that I think about looking back is that I didn't realize what I was doing in that moment. Like right. I was so much in a bubble and I was like, oh yeah, this is normal. I'm just making semis of every slam I enter. Mm -hmm. And it took me weeks and months and years to process what I did and be like, wow, no, that was an amazing accomplishment. And it, it's still to this day, I look back and, and learn from what I did or, or realize more things that happen. And so it's, um, it's, it's a unique kind of thing that happened to me for sure. Yeah, that's not a unique issue with pro athletes that have success early in their careers, right? Like the athlete that makes a Stanley Cup final his rookie year probably just thinks, oh, I'm going to be here all the time, you right. know, and, you know, and unfortunately that's not the case, but I would and, imagine. And then the fans and yeah. media think yeah. that too. Yeah. And then suddenly if you don't do that every year, they're like, well, you suck now. Yeah. I mean, that's true. The, the faster you rise, it's like the faster people are probably, I mean, your end probably looking to see how is she going to fall or what the next step's going to be. Um, you know, and, and kind of just going off that for the positive side of things. Not that, not that you aren't normal. I think you're pretty normal so far. We'll see. <laughs> we'll but, see. <laughs> but uh, what, what were some of the, I guess, the best perks of becoming famous and, you know, in Canada, especially where the success hadn't exist. What were some of the best perks, some of the best things you got to do, people you got to meet? What was that all about? Well, I have to say, first and foremost, uh, just getting asked for a picture and being recognized is, is still so humbling to me. Like, it's such an honor that someone cares enough to s waste 10 seconds of their life asking me for a picture. And to this day, it's still how I feel. So it's super gratifying. And hearing about tennis in Canada in the subsequent years after that success was very satisfying because I would get these messages and stories from coaches like, hey, our summer camps are sold out, like in January and it's like <laughs> yeah. for this July and um, tennis clubs just kind of exploding and, and more players playing and to even think that you're a small part of that is is really cool I mean we changed the landscape of yep. tennis in Canada and I include Milos in those results back in the day and then obviously more recently the next gen of players Andrescu, Shapovalov, yeah. uh, Felix so but to kind of be a pioneer in the beginning yeah. of that is is super special and um, it's just such a cool thing to be a part of. You kind of ushered in that new generation of Canadian tennis. Obviously, there's been younger players to come through. You being the first in the top five to make a final, Milos, and then Bianca just knocking the door down and winning a major. 
Uh, and I always admire the fact about you, the Canadians, I'm grouping you all together. You guys kind of all stick together. It's like a, it's <laughs> like a brother sisterhood thing where I think there's some real camaraderie there among all the Canadian uh, tennis players and athletes. I'd also say, look, I trained at the national training center in Montreal uh, at age 15 and I was there kind of on and off between there and Florida. And I remember seeing kids like Felix in the younger group. I mean, he's way younger than me <laughs> seeing him at whatever age he must've been and being like, wow, he, he looks good. So <laughs> I'd like to say I called his success early on. You were early on the Felix train. Yeah. yeah but, um, so it's just been nice to see this progression. And nowadays, you know, there's so many kids playing and it's, uh, I'll go back to like our old, my old club and see a poster of me up there and, and kids training all over the place. And it's, um, it's very heartwarming. Well, I've got one for you that I wanted to bring up, which had to be surreal. And it would be surreal for me because I was at Indian Wells a couple of years ago. Huge hockey guy. Saw Wayne Gretzky almost fainted. <laughs> he sits in your boxes now to watch your matches. So what's it like having <laughs> yeah. Wayne be a fan of yours? That was a crazy <laughs> moment because... It happened for the first time at the U.S. Open in 2015, and I didn't know about it. So I'm, like, on the court, and I see my mom talking to this lady that I don't recognize who ended up being Janet, his wife, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and because they have a daughter, Emma, who, uh -huh. who plays tennis. And so I was just, like, thought I recognized him, but I was trying to be focused for my match. And then afterwards, my mom's like, oh, yeah, like, I was just chatting with the Gretzkys. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, mom, like, this <laughs> is crazy. What has the world come to? So... Yeah, I mean, obviously getting to meet Canadian royalty like that or like with Drake when oh, I first yeah. met him, I I literally, well, I didn't die when I met him. I mean, it was super cool to meet him, but then he posted the picture of us like on his account. Oh. And I remember seeing that and I was at the airport in Toronto flying somewhere and I saw it on my phone and I was like, mom, Drake just posted the picture of us. <laughs> and I literally almost like fell to the ground because I was like, what is life? And so... It's, it's been awesome and just to have their support and then seeing them along the way at events yeah. or other things, you like have this friendship from yeah. years back. And so it's, it's been nice. I would say the perks would be meeting people. Like you can talk about the money and the fame and other stuff, but just getting <laughs> to meet people that you looked up to. And that was before the celebrity basketball game where I think he was one of the coaches. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He was the coach there in 2016 and he kept me on the bench for most of the game, which I was pretty pissed yeah, off. And that about. was like your old sport too. Like you, you've kind of said that you yes. were good at basketball, right? I was when I was like 12. <laughs> yeah. And amongst girls my age at the celebrity game, most of the players on the team were men yeah. and mostly tall. And you just have no chance, like mm -hmm. the physicality. And the only other female was a WNBA player. So I was <laughs> yeah, literally yeah. like the shrimp, like not knowing what they're doing on the court. So I don't blame him for not giving me any court time, but I was also disappointed. I remember I got elbowed in the boo by Jason Sudeikis. Oh, we're going to have to get to the bottom of that. No, but the, that's not they take it so seriously. And I'm like, guys, just give me the ball once. Like, I just want to like, try make two points. Like, I'm glad you brought it. that up. I mean, Ted Lasso, he's got this like positive image, but no, like he's out there throwing elbows. He, he was wild. <laughs> he was like, they all just want the ball to try show off and like be like, I can play basketball, but... Uh, amazing that was that was actually a really fun weekend the all-star weekend in toronto that was awesome i've gotten to go to richard branson's island a couple wow. of times he's so nice i mean we've been dancing on the table together at 2 a.m in his <laughs> great room on the island and just um so many cool experiences with cool people and for me it's not that they're famous but just that they're successful in another field and yeah. you can relate on things but also learn so many things yeah. from them. And I just find it so fascinating to meet people who've kind of gone through a similar pass, although in a different, you know, sector of work, of course. but, and then who've experienced, you know, coming from normal to a superstar, whatever, and experienced similar kind of life experiences as you is, um, very relatable. More with Jeannie Bouchard here on Tennis Channel Inside. And that's a very good piece of advice. I think anyone can take outside of you know, even the sporting arena I do have to ask you, though, with some of the struggles that you've had with injuries, do you look back at your career with uh, any level of regrets? Do you dwell on, you know, the, the success or what could have been, or is it just tunnel vision to the future? Everyone has regrets. I'm trying to not have as many as I can. So when I'm old and in my rocking chair, I'll be like, okay, like, I tried to do everything I could. Obviously, looking back, there are some decisions I would do differently, maybe not work with some coaches or continue working with some coaches. But, um, you know, in the moment, I always knew I was doing the best I could. And I just I wish I was more prepared in a way for kind of the onslaught of the scrutiny in 2015 and how tough the media and fans would be on me kind of. Oh, you made the finals of a slam last year. That means you 
have to win a Grand Slam this yeah. year and just not realizing, like, it's so hard to do these things. Like, yeah. you can't expect, you know, these results every single year for the rest of your career unless you're basically Serena, who's an anomaly, and you can't Even then, it's like they're hard on her if she doesn't win Exactly. Every year. She makes the finals of a slam <laughs> yeah. and loses, and people are like, oh, yeah, that was a terrible tournament for her. Like, yeah. it's people are never satisfied and never happy and... It's easy for them to say, you know, sitting at home and with yeah. not even having to deal with one ounce of the pressure that we have to deal with. So, I mean, I have so much to say about all that yeah. stuff. Would it's you, really. Would, would you say that you kind of have like this love hate relationship with social media because there's a lot of good out of it? And I think your attitude is super positive in a lot of ways, more than most people would take the kind of flack you do. But is there still that kind of love hate? You know, relationship there? It's more of a realizing that there's pros and cons yeah. to it, as there is with everything in life. Your life mm. lessons from Jeannie. Um, <laughs> it's more of just like, hey, there's positives. Like, I can interact with my fans. I can make money. You know, I can hawk products on social media and make money. But I can also just... It's, it's, you're just very accessible. So people mm -hmm. can reach right. you and say whatever they want. And it can be anonymous. And so, you know, I, there's no way to kind of fix it because we do have freedom of speech. Like, what are you going to do? Police every single account that says something yeah. mean. I mean, when people are watching sports in arenas, they scream mean things to the players. That's not yeah. illegal. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Obviously there's a line when it's death threats, which is completely unacceptable yeah. because that is illegal, but it's more just like, it's more just like people not realizing how hard and stressful our jobs actually are. I liked how you had uh, that one post where you had Caroline Wozniacki's back where she was getting trolled and you're just like, no, you belong on my page. Like that, <laughs> just something about that post was like, wow, this, this person gets it. Like I thought that was super funny in yeah. that regard. It just shows you, you will never make everyone happy and no matter what you do, there will be people that hate. So you just have to do you, do what you want and take it as a compliment. I mean, they're taking time out of their day to write something mean to you. Like it's literally a reverse compliment. Would you say that during those down times, you maybe were a little hard on yourself and just kind of some of the losses on court, you took a little rougher than you, I don't want to say have a different outlook now, but it seems like you are a little more positive on court and it's, you know, you realize how much of a privilege it is to even be out there. Yes. Looking back specifically, I remember losing in Indian Wells in 2015 to uh, Serenko from the Ukraine. And I took that loss really, really hard. And I had just made the quarters of the Australian Open and was on this, you know, top 10 in the world, whatever. And I was just like, how could you lose to a player ranked whatever she was? And looking back, I feel like that kind of started a little snowball effect of losing a bunch of matches and being more negative and hard on myself. And looking back, I wish I wasn't that hard on myself. Like, hey, you lost a match. For, I, w I wish I had a little more amnesia after losing matches because I would take lo lo yeah. losses pretty hard and I would like not want to leave my hotel room for a day and just like yeah. wallow in self-pity and uh, I really try not to do that anymore. Like, hey, the, the world is still going to turn. Yeah. That's wisdom and age, too. Like, just getting older and understanding. Yes. But, but at the same time, yeah. I feel like I put hard expectations on myself. But I also feel it was exacerbated by the expectations by everyone else. So I was like, well, if they expect this from yeah. me, I should, too. So, yeah, that is a terrible loss. Oh, my gosh. And so, you know, when you hear something often enough, it yeah. enters your own brain and you start to believe it. Uh -huh. So hearing over and over again how many matches I lost in a row, how I was too focused on photo shoots instead of tennis, like subconsciously it kind of like Crept in goes there, yeah. into your brain. And I'm I'm pissed that I allowed that to even enter 1%. So on that same note, Jeannie, um, you know, there's no good time to get injured, but you're using this as a blessing, as an opportunity to get into TV. What made you want to do this work not just one shift like two weeks straight for tennis channel after i saw you on the uh hockey house with ryan kessler yes <laughs> his thing that was the only media thing i think i ever saw you on now you're full bore tennis commentator in your injury time well look when you're playing a full tennis schedule it's really hard to do these types of off-court activities it takes time and it's hard to schedule with tennis results um as soon as i had the injury i was like might as well take advantage of it. I'm going to regret not doing things during this time. If I just sit on my couch and watch Netflix the whole time, yeah, that's easy, but I'll look back and I'll regret it. So I thought, why not challenge myself? I'm the type of person who I need to like do something hard. I need to push myself. I, I like to work hard and 
and get that adrenaline rush. I'm yeah. missing that of walking out on the court and winning matches. And I'm telling you, when I go up to the, the booth and in the booth for the commentary or at the desk for live TV, I get a surge of adrenaline. Yeah. And it's well, the juice is fine. <laughs> it's not quite the same, but I'm like, okay, I feel alive. I feel like I have a goal. I feel like I'm working. Because if I'm not working, I'm going to go crazy because I'm just too much. It's like, yeah, people don't understand that you can't train 24 hours a day, whether you post something or do another mm. job, like you need to have that balance. Uh, I think people are realizing that more and true. Social, social media has changed from when I first got onto the public eye to now. And people now obviously realize it's a highlight reel or it's literally whatever I choose to show you. So it can be 1% of my life. It's not what I do day to day. But back in the day, people really took it as is. And I'm like, guys, I trained for six hours. Then I went to the movies and took a selfie. <laughs> and you're telling me to go train. Yeah, and yeah. it's like, do you sit at your desk 24 hours a day? Or do you only post about sitting at your mm -hmm. desk 24 hours a day? Like I actually, for me, training is my day to day job. So I find posting about the other cool stuff I do more interesting. Yeah. And that's why I, I choose. And also my phone's not even <laughs> near me when I'm training. Like I'm focused, but when yeah. I'm at the mall with my friends, yeah, my then phone's in there. my hand. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's just like such like ignorant, like thoughts and things that people say. It's just, it's frustrating, but you gotta let it go. Whatever. <laughs> I don't care. You're getting there. I feel like if we would have done this like a couple years ago, the tone might've been a little different, but uh -huh. you're starting to, you know, let it roll off your back <laughs> a little more. Um, I was going to ask you though, what, is something, what's one thing that's been harder than you thought it would be about being on TV, whether it's calling a match or a live studio show? Or So I feel more comfortable doing TC Live and the studio hits because that's more of a conversational interview type and I've done a million interviews in my life. And you know the game so well that you can talk tennis, like it's not. Yes, yeah. but commentary is a whole other beast because you're talking about, first of all, you have to be re very reactive. You have to talk about something that just happened live two seconds ago. You can't. And, and so it's like realizing what you saw and putting it into a coherent sentence in two seconds. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a skill. Yeah. And then knowing when to talk, when not to talk. As a fan, when I watch tennis and they talk during the point, I hate that. Yeah. When they talk too much, it gets annoying. But then you want actual substance and information at the same time. So it's a, it's a hard balance to, to figure out. Um, but the biggest thing over everything is you have to study a lot. And I'm like, I get in here, I do hair and makeup for two hours. And during those two hours, I have my computer and my notebook and I'm catching up on matches from the day. And I'm, you know, reading, watching highlights, reading statistics, mm -hmm. uh, Googling players. Like I know so much about these players <laughs> I've talked about in the past two weeks that I never knew about in my whole career. So it's like, I want to be prepared and like have things to say and form opinions on facts, but I have to know the facts. So it's yeah. like so much more studying than I thought. Well, now you're prepared to go back and play with all this new data. So I was saying this <laughs> yeah. yesterday. This is great preparation to play matches. I should watch more and study players more before I play them. And now like, especially the specific players I watched full matches of and like researched, I'm like, I know so much about them. I'm going to step on the court and be like, I know everything about you. I'm well, going to kick your ass. Well, you know what happened four years ago, right? Like, I'm sure you're aware of the Yes, I've heard symmetry. it many times, and now y'all are saying it too much. That <laughs> it's too putting much? pressure okay, on me. Okay, I won't say it, but just <laughs> just Google who was uh, a guest analyst in the studio and what happened at My that My doubles partner. Open. Yes, it was your doubles partner. So, yes, I know. Hopefully that happens to me as well. But now it's like, oh, my gosh, everyone's talking about it too much. Like, I'm going to go out and be so nervous. Like, <laughs> now I have to play not only yeah. for myself, but I have to play for the Tennis uh, Channel crew who expect me to win a slam we now. Do. We're, we're very in demand. <laughs> we're very demanding here. Uh, Jeannie, this was a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, I had one quick question before we let you sure. go here. I know you've got some celebrity friends. I know you've got some athlete friends. And I've always wanted to ask you, who's better at the other sport? Are you better at golf or is Michelle Lee West better at tennis? <laughs> I am better at golf. She okay. was terrible. We had this one. <laughs> yeah, terrible. <laughs> we had this fun media day trying to teach each other our respective yeah. sports. And I mean, this girl was like, like she was swinging it like a, a golf swing, which I guess is normal, but it was, it was awful. And I had, I had never actually touched a golf club in my life until I met her that day. And she was even impressed with me. So oh, natural athlete there. And, uh, I guess a pretty good friend on that assessment, just an honest <laughs> friend too. Um, Jeannie, again, pleasure. Uh, well, very last thing, what are the goals going forward for you? I know TV, you've, you've done a very good job at this. I don't say that, you know, uh, to I'm everybody. sure you just say that. But no, it's, it's, it's a thing now. I mean, you're, you're still have a lot of tennis left. Hopefully what are the goals short and long term? Do you see this as maybe a career when tennis is all said and done? 
Well, I'm happy that I got the experience with this and that I have film of myself now. And so if I do want to consider it once I really retire, then I think hopefully it can be an option for me. And I think I'll kind of decide that later on, but I was super happy to get this experience and maybe I'll do even more before I am back on the court full time. Uh, In terms of goals, I just want to get back on the court. Watching so much tennis the past two weeks makes me miss it so much more. Like, it's literally painful sometimes to watch because I'm like, I want to, like, swing a racket. I'm, like, (laughs) dying, literally. So um, I just want to get healthy and be back on the court pain-free. Like, that would just be so amazing. And then once that happens, the rest is gravy.